copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 151. Investigative shooting at 2791 Francis Avenue. That's all. Rose and Clayton. listen to this succeeding broadcast of Calling All Cars, you can't help noticing how important motor car performance is in modern warfare against crime. A police car has no, is no place for slugging, sputtering, slow-burning gasoline. Speed, power, acceleration, quick starting. These a police car gasoline must have. Is it not significant that more police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and other emergency equipment use Rio Grande cracked gasoline wherever it is sold than any other brand? Do you think the police department of Los Angeles, for example, would use Rio Grande cracked gasoline month after month if it did not come up to specifications in competitive tests and continue to deliver police car performance? You can have in your car the very same gasoline that has helped make the Los Angeles Police Department one of the most efficient in the United States. You can have the same quick starting, the same fast acceleration, the same surging power that police cars must have and always get in Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Try a tank full tomorrow and know what police car performance is. And now once again we present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. The story you will hear tonight is one of the finest examples of police detection this department has on record. The officers assigned to the case had no known killer to look for, no clues to help their investigation, no actual facts at hand to even definitely call it murder. But because by training, police officers know that every tiny item is of vast importance in their work, that even the simplest clue may lead to the final cracking of a case. The end of tonight's story is very different from what it might have been had the officers been inclined to be at all lax. Stories like this prove time and time again the fact that even the most perfectly worked out crime has almost no chance of being successful in the face of trained police detection. Before Christmas, 1935. In the homicide department of the Los Angeles Police, Detectives Ray Giese and T.R. Ryan are holding down the office when a call comes in from Officer Vern Philippi of the Georgia Street Division regarding a shooting at 2791 Francis Street. Arriving at the small house a few minutes later, Ryan and Giese are met by Officer Philippi, who informs them that the mother of the victim is next door with a neighbor friend. After a cursory examination of the death bungalow, they walk next door and interrogate her. This is Lieutenant Giese, ma'am, and uh, his partner. How do you do, Lieutenant? How do you do, do ma'am? I hope you won't mind answering a few questions no, for us. No, no, not at all. I know these things have to be done. You see, my son was a police surgeon. It was your son who was shot, ma'am? Yes. What is your name? Well, my full name is Claire Van Alstein Williams. And your son's name? Robert. Robert Williams. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. Now, I wonder if you feel up to telling us exactly what happened this morning. Everything you can remember about the events leading up to the shooting. I believe I can recall everything. Well, that's fine, ma'am. Jot this down, will you, Ryan? Right. It, it was an accident. I had been sitting in my room just off the kitchen, and I'd heard my son talking to someone for some time. I, I couldn't hear just what they were saying, but they were laughing and joking, apparently on very friendly terms. I was sitting in my rocking chair, sewing, as I recall. I, I just heard quite a long laugh when someone came towards the door to my room and it opened. And... Don't let me bother you, Mother. I just want to get that gun of mine out of my bureau. I want to show it to someone. Well, what are, you, what are you boys having such a good time about in there? Oh, just talking. You know how it is. Well, you certainly seem to be having a great laugh. I never heard so much laughing. Good for the soul, laughter. As long as that's all you have to worry about, you'll be all right. Sometimes I wonder whether I have a full-grown man for a son or a little boy. Oh, well. 
<laughs> now, what was that? Goodness, I hope those two haven't gone and done something foolish. Well, what was all that noise? Robert. Robert. It was an accident. Uh, an accident. You shot Robert. I couldn't help it. It was an awful accident. I, I couldn't help it. Oh, Robert. Well, that won't do you any good. He can't answer you. Well, well, quick. Call the police. Don't stand there with that gun in your hand. Go call the police. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I, I'll go right now. Oh, Robert. What's happened to you? What's happened to you? Waited some time, and the boy didn't return, and no one came, so I called you myself. I can't imagine what happened to him. Doesn't sound very sensible, does it? Had you ever seen this boy before, Mrs. Williams? No, never, but I, I believe him, Lieutenant. I believe he was telling the truth. He looked so young, and he had such a fine face. I couldn't help but believe him. I see. Well, now, when you entered the room, uh, where was this boy standing? Directly behind Robert. Oh, did he have the gun in his hand, ma'am? Yes. Yes, he did. It was wrapped in a towel. Wrapped in a towel? What in the world for? Well, I, I don't know. Maybe he was cleaning it. Anyway, that's the way it was. And, Lieutenant, he looked so sorry for what he'd done. It was dreadful to see that young face looking so horribly scared. <laughs> Returning to the death bungalow, the two men begin a more thorough examination of the premises. Slumped over the kitchen table lies the body of Robert Williams, a grotesque caricature of a human being. His arms hang down, dangle on the floor. On the back of his head, a jagged wound shows mute evidence of the violent death that has snuffed out his life. Behind him, lying on the small stove, is the death gun, still wrapped in the white towel. As Giese and Brian survey the room, Giese stands suddenly staring at the table upon which the body slumps. Oh, why the look, Ray? I just happen to see something that doesn't make sense, that's all. What do you mean? Here, I'll show you. You see this tablecloth here on the table? Yeah. Notice how it's pulled out of shape by the victim's arm here, obviously, when he slumped down? Why, uh, yeah. Well, then will you tell me how these things here on the table managed to stay right in place in perfect order while said tablecloth was busily slipping out from under them? What? Say, by golly, all right, that doesn't make much sense, does it? Hmm, not here. Someone's obviously put everything in order except the cloth. That's caught under his arm against the table. Who'd do that? What reason would there be for it? That's one of the things I want to find out before we call this thing an accident. It all looks kind of fishy to me. Hey, Ray, you think the kid did it? I don't know. But I'm almost certain that whoever pulled the trigger on that gun meant to. Say, that puts things in a different light. What about that old lady? I don't know, Brian. But it strikes me that right now we'd better give this place a pretty careful going over. If we found that one little bit of contradiction, we might be able to find more, right? Why not? All right, suppose you take the front room and the old lady's bedroom while I go over the kitchen here. And don't miss a trick. If this is murder, we're going to have a tough time proving it. A plenty tough time. <laughs> After an afternoon spent in minute probings into every nook and cranny of the house, questioning of the neighbors, fingerprinting of all the wood and crockery in the kitchen, Detectives Giese and Brian return to the neighbor's house and once again face Mrs. Williams. Mrs. Williams, had you ever seen that gun before today? Oh, yes, it was Robert. I know, because you see, I bought it for him myself. You're absolutely certain that it's the same gun? Yes, quite. But it should be easy enough to prove that. I, I have the numbers of it in the little black book in my dresser drawer. You have? Well, do you suppose if I sent someone over there now to get it, they could find it? Yes, I'm sure they could. It was right in the top drawer, a little black book. I could get it for you, Mrs. Williams, if you like. Oh, thank you, ma'am. That would help. I'll be right back. Uh, now, Mrs. Williams, another thing. We found two bullet holes in the kitchen floor. Can you tell me just where they came from? Home? Hmm. Oh, those, of course. It, well, it, it's rather silly the way it happened. At least it would probably sound so to you. But for quite some time, I'd heard someone prowling around the house and had me frightened. You reported to the police, ma'am? Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't think it was serious enough to warrant that. But I did buy that gun for Robert, and that made me feel better. Well, anyway, 
One night I was lying in bed almost asleep when I thought I heard someone at the back door. I called Robert and told him. He went into the kitchen. Then I heard him firing. I went to him and he said he'd scared them away. By shooting holes through the kitchen floor, Mrs. Williams? Well, I don't know whether he meant to shoot in the floor, but by shooting, anyway... Here's the book, Mrs. Williams. I found it just where you said it would be. Uh, just give it to me, please. Oh, certainly. See if these numbers check with that guns, Brian. Hmm. S&W, 419618. Smith and Wesson, 419618. Check. That leaves no doubt about that, then. Was there some doubt, Lieutenant? What's that? Oh, why, well, yes and no, Mrs. Williams. Just wanted to be certain, that's all. <laughs> Placing a guard around the house to see that no one enters or disturbs anything. Also a man to watch the neighbor's house and Mrs. Williams. Geesey and Brian return to their office to make plans for the following day. That night, Lieutenant Geesey does little sleeping. All through the long hours, his mind keeps whirling, formulating questions, answering them, rejecting the answers. Is there really any truth in the old lady's story? Or is she a clever woman capable of killing her own son? And if she did, why... Why? That's the question to find the answer to. Why? The following morning, he and Brian pay a visit to the late Dr. Williams' office, where his secretary furnishes the first startling bit of news. I've been thinking seriously of calling you, gentlemen. There are several things that don't seem quite like the doctor that have been worrying me. I thought you should know about them. Well, by all means, miss. On the morning the doctor was shot, yesterday that was, I phoned his house. Oh, you did? Yes. You see, there was an emergency case here, and I wanted to get the doctor down as soon as possible. Did you talk to him? Well, not the first time I called. I talked to his mother. She said that he was in the bath and couldn't talk. But then I, I heard some disturbances, and she sounded as though she were talking to him, and then she said to call back in ten minutes. And you did? Yes. This time I talked to the doctor and told him about the emergency. He told me that he'd have to have breakfast and that he'd get down directly after that. About what time was this, miss? It was, uh, 9.30. Yes, at 9.30. He said that he'd be down by 10.30 at the latest. You're sure it was the doctor you were talking to? Oh, certainly. I was in the habit of talking to him on the phone. I knew his voice. But there could have been no mistake. Well, what did you do when he didn't show up? I called his house again and talked to some police officers. He told me that there had been an accident and that the doctor wouldn't be down. Then I sent another doctor out on the case. But it struck me as peculiar at the time. And then when I read in the paper this morning about the shooting and all, well, it, it just didn't sound right to me. Well, to be quite frank with you, miss, it doesn't sound right to us either. Well, I, I'm not a naturally suspicious person, Lieutenant, but when the doctor told me himself that he'd be down by 10.30, and then I read about his having been accidentally shot while looking at his hunting guns, it, it sounded awfully strange. Well, you were quite right to be suspicious about it, miss, and thanks a lot. Come on, Brian, we've got things to do and no time to do them in. <laughs> This first real lead to work on, Geesey and Brian start a process of reconstruction. A return visit to the death bungalow and further questioning of the white-haired mother bring these facts to light. The death gun, which Mrs. Williams claimed to have bought for her son, traces back to a police officer who tells Geesey he sold it to her when she answered an ad he had inserted in the paper. Examination of the cartridges and the gun show them to be regulation police ammunition. Yet boxes of cartridges found at the doctor's private effects are special target shots differing considerably from the regulation size. The name of the man who manufactured these specials for Dr. Williams is disclosed, and Geesey, accompanied by Brian, drive to Pasadena to interrogate him. I guess you've heard or read of the unfortunate accident that happened to Dr. Williams by now. Yes, yes, I, I read about it in papers. Funny thing, I, I was just going to send him over a, a new kind of uh, cartridge I, I'd cooked up here. As I said to my wife only a couple of days ago, Hattie, if this doesn't cut a clean hole in them targets, then, well, I give up. Uh, is this shell I have here one of yours? Eh? Let, let me look. Yeah, yeah, sure shooting that. That's mine. Then none like it anywhere else. Did you ever see Dr. Williams with a gun like this in his possession? Mm, no, no, sir. Never, never did. You sure of that? Oh, yes, positive. I, I know every gun he had. Uh, you clean them for him sometimes. He... No, he never had that one around. No, sir. You'd be willing to swear to that on the stand if we needed you? Uh, swear on the stand? Uh, what's the matter? I, 
I thought the doc was shot accidental. What, what are all these questions for? I'm sorry, I can't tell you that just now. But thanks for the information anyway. It helps no end. Come on, Brian, I think we've got what we want. Convinced now that the accidental shooting is in reality a well-planned murder, Gizio returns to headquarters, tells Captain Wallace of his investigation and subsequent findings. Then, on the following morning, the two detectives go to the little house determined to make Mrs. Williams talk. But when they arrive, they find her other son with her. So first, decide to see what light he can bring to bear on the question. The younger son is at first reticent to answer questions, but as the sincerity of the detectives finally makes itself apparent, he weakens. Talk. Oh, honestly, Lieutenant, I, I don't know what to think. I can't believe that Mother would do this, and yet, well, she's been acting strangely for so long that... So it can't be. Just what do you mean by strangely? Well, not right. You know, saying it would be better if we were all dead and out of the way than living here in poverty and all sorts of things like that. I think she felt pretty bitter against the world for letting it down. Had she ever threatened you? Oh, no. No, she... Once she did suggest a suicide pact, but I... Well, I just laid it to nerves and forgot it. Some nerves, all right? Yeah. Now, look, young fellow. I appreciate the spot you're in, your own mother and all that. You must realize our position, too. If your mother had some sort of a mania about killing off the family, then we've got to do something to stop it. If we don't, you'll be next. Then what? I, I know, but what can I do? Well, nothing right now. But if this goes to court, which I'm pretty certain it will, I want your testimony about what you've just told us. How about it? Well, naturally, if I swear to tell the truth, I'll have to do just that. But I don't want to. I don't want any part of it. Well, it may not be necessary, Mr. Williams, but if it is... Well, then, then I'll tell what I know. Good. I thought that's what you'd say. And believe me, you won't regret it. Now, let's talk to Mrs. Williams, Brian. I'm going to be very frank with you, Mrs. Williams. Very frank. I'm going to tell you right now that we do not believe your story. You don't believe? Surely you, you can't mean you don't think it was an accident. That's exactly what we do mean, ma'am. You mean you think that young man... No, ma'am. Uh, we don't think that young man ever existed. But then... I don't see... I'm afraid the only other answer is you, Mrs. Williams. I? Exactly. You, you think I did it? Didn't you? Shoot my own son? Why, I don't see how you can even imagine such a thing. It just isn't possible. You walked into that room and shot your son as he was eating his breakfast. Lieutenant, I, I can see how you might imagine that as having happened. But I assure you, what I've told you is the truth. It was an accident. Nevertheless, Mrs. Williams, we'll have to book you on suspicion of murder. But you can't do that. It's not right. I'm sorry, ma'am, but I'm afraid you'll have to come to headquarters. Booked in the Los Angeles County Jail on suspicion of murder, Mrs. Williams refuses to admit any knowledge beyond what she has already told the officers. Quietly dignified, her answers are those of an unusually well-educated woman. Her aristocratic gentleness makes the detectives ill at ease as they carry on an unending line of questions. Haste with all the irregularities of her story, the gray-haired mother quietly makes the same reply. I can understand how you gentlemen must feel under the circumstances. I realize that there are things about this that put me in a bad light. But I assure you, what I have told you is the truth. I have nothing to hide. You are simply mistaken. That's all I can say. But despite the repeated denials, the charge of murder sticks. And at last, Mrs. Williams prepares to make a desperate battle for freedom. Her appearance in court immediately creates a stir of sympathy. The prosecuting attorney, realizing that he has a tough assignment ahead of him, prepares his brief carefully, checks and rechecks every tiny piece of evidence. And finally the day comes when all evidence has been heard. Nothing remains but the prosecution's final summary. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have heard the evidence in this case. You have heard link after link forged against the defendant. Now there remains nothing but your decision. However... Before you 12 men and women retire to your chambers to decide this case, I should like to show you in my own words what really happened that day. The detectives who have worked on this case from its inception have built a case that brings to mind the whole picture of this murder. I say murder because that's what really happened. The defense claims that there was another man in that room 
when Dr. Williams was shot. That the defendant was in her own room all morning until she heard a shot. Now I am going to show you that there was no other man. That the defendant simply executed a well-planned murder as a general might execute a carefully planned maneuver in a battle. I ask you to go with me to that kitchen this afternoon to visualize the picture I paint. Dr. Williams has an appointment at his office at 10.30. His secretary has testified to that. He has talked to her over the phone and said that he will be down to the office as soon as he has had breakfast. As I see the picture, he is sitting at the table in the kitchen and his mother prepares his soup. My father from the office was an emergency. Some fellow needs an operation. Well, I'll have your breakfast in a second, son. Only I wish you didn't have to rush so. You never have a minute with me anymore. Well, I can't help it, dear. That's what happens to people who get mixed up in this doctoring business. Are you happy being a doctor, Robert? Oh, Mother, that's a funny question. Of course I'm happy. I mean, aren't you sometimes sorry you have to give your life to other people? Don't you feel a little shabby? A little below your rightful station in life? Well... There's no, no use you going on talking about station in life. I wish you'd realize that things are different than they used to be. The world has changed. And people have changed with it. People haven't changed. They've just given in. Let circumstances pull them down, take their rightful station away from them. You know, Robert, sometimes I think we'd be, we'd be better off in another place. Mother, you don't sound well. I'm worried about no, you. No, no, no. All right, you needn't worry anymore. Here, now eat your eggs. Thanks. I'm going in the other room a second. Well, nevertheless, you've got to take better care of yourself before your nerves snap. I don't like that kind of talk. It's true talk. That's why you don't like it. You know as well as I do that this family was never meant to do menial work. If money-crazy people hadn't taken what rightfully belonged to us, we wouldn't have to live in a little bungalow like this, four rooms, and both of my sons working like ordinary laborers. It isn't right. You know, Mother, according to the papers, the revolution is due soon. Maybe that'll take care of it. But really, Mother, kidding aside, you've got to realize that the classes have drawn together. There's no aristocracy anymore. Everyone is working for a living, and there's no disgrace in it. Do you perhaps know that you're young? You can't feel the same as I do. You can't appreciate the way I feel in the eyes of these people around us. The Williams is living here like, like ants. Oh, well, as long as you can cook eggs like these, everything's going to be all right. They're tops as far as I'm concerned. I hope you'll always be happy, Rob. Oh. What makes you say that? What's in that towel? Something that belongs to me. Something that will make me happy. I guess I don't follow you, Mother. However, if something will make you happy, that's enough for me. You're happy seldom enough lately. You better eat your breakfast, son. Don't mind me. You're right. I've got to hurry to make it now. I'll just stand here, right behind you while you eat. You don't mind, do you? Not if you like to stand there. But I can't see why you want to watch me eat. But, however, that's your business. Yes. My business. Goodbye, Robert. Hmm? What'd you say? Nothing. Just thinking. Eat your breakfast. There. Done. Now, Frank. Then myself. Then. Peace. Peace. From there on, it is a simple matter to see what happened. Mrs. Williams gathered all the doctor's hunting paraphernalia together and spread it out on the table. She cleared the breakfast dishes away and washed them carefully. And she made her first serious mistake. The tablecloth was caught under the doctor's arm against the table and she couldn't remove it, so she left it there. But she failed to reckon on this when she put the hunting knife and cottages on the table because if they had been there when the doctor was shot, they would have been pulled out of line with the tablecloth. That was her first mistake, and from there she made a string of them, small enough alone, but put together large enough to show conclusively that she had planned this murder for some time in advance. Those mistakes are, one, she fired those two shots in the kitchen for herself to test the gun. Two, every day she fired a cap pistol we found in her room to get the neighbors used to the noise. That's the reason none of them could remember having heard a shot. Three, when the detectives first questioned her, her only concern was for the boy who had supposedly just killed her son. 
She showed no remorse at all for her own son. I think that I've covered all the points in this case, and I know that in spite of the sentiment and sympathy, you members of the jury must feel for this woman. You will do your duty and return an honest verdict, guilty of murder in the first degree. <laughs> the verdict? We have, Your Honor. Will the clerk of the court please read it? We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder and recommend life imprisonment. It is now our pleasure to present District Attorney Buren Fitz. Mr. Fitz. This case was one in which anything might have happened. Had not the officers investigating it done a thorough job of gathering evidence? And had our department not spent many long hours fitting the pieces together into a chain out of which there could be no escaping? There was one major hurdle for us to get over. And that was the fact that the defendant looked and acted at all times like anything but a murderer. Her age and her looks were against us from the start. Yet in spite of this sentiment, we were able to present such a strong case that in the end, justice was done. Mrs. Williams was sentenced to life imprisonment in Tehachapi Prison, where she is now confined. Thank you, Mr. Fitz. Do you know of any place where you can get more for your money than from the Rio Grande Independent Service Station near you? First, you get the courteous service of an owner, an owner-operator, who is interested in the community affairs of your neighborhood. Second, you get police car performance. Rio Grande cracked gasoline, the same gasoline used by more police cars wherever it is sold than any other brand. The only gasoline sold in your neighborhood that is produced by the patented Sinclair cracking process. Third, you get Sinclair motor oils, thoroughly de-waxed and de-jellied by special Sinclair processes to make them flow freely winter and summer and stand up under the most grueling abuse. Then you get many services absolutely free. This radio program, Calling All Cars, which surveys show to be one of the most popular Western broadcasts. And Calling All Cars News, which is brim full of newsy, fascinating stories of screen and police activities. And Police Money, with gasoline purchases good for valuable gifts. G-Man pistols, fingerprinting outfits, sirens, rings, handcuffs, bracelets, and many others to bring happiness to some boy or girl. Do you know of any oil company that gives you more for your money? Start the Rio Grande habit tomorrow. Buy your gasoline and motor oil from your nearest Rio Grande independent dealer. Get more for your money. I'll send this police calling on all cars. Attention all cars. A cancellation broadcast 151. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. Rolls and questions. Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company. <laughs>